late, babe. I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for that for your sake. You see, I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte, and I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science for life, have you got this cucumber sandwich that's cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir, eight bottles and a pint. Uh, why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I merely ask for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. <laughs> I've often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Oh, good heavens, is marriage so demoralizing as that? Oh, no, I, I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I've not had much experience of it myself up to the present. I've only been married once, and that was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I am much interested in your family life, Blaine. Uh, no, sir. It, it is not a very interesting subject. Uh, I never think of it myself. Hmm. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to be absolutely without moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Ah, how are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. Well, I believe it is customary in good society to engage in some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. Ah, oh, what on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people that you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Hmm, God, nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. <laughs> By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Yeah. Shropshire? <laughs> yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta. And Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, my dear boy. But I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite prove your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. But I'm in love with <laughs> Gwendolyn. I've come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. Oh, I don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but I see absolutely nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. And one usually is, I believe. And then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. <laughs> if I ever get married, I will certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algie. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please do not touch the cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> they are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. But you have been eating them all this time. Well, that is a very different thing. She is my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And very good bread and butter it is, too. My dear fellow, you need not eat as if you are going to eat at all. You behave like you are married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't believe you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. They don't think it right. That is nonsense. Oh, it isn't. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. In the second place, I won't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And if you are to marry her, you'll have to clear up this whole question of Cecily. Cecily? Well, what on earth do you mean by Cecily? What do you mean, Algy? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to tell me you've had my <laughs> cigarette case all this time? 
I wish to goodness you would let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Oh, well, I wish you would offer one. I haven't been more than usually hard up. Well, there's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Now that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. Thank you, Lane. Oh, but it makes no matter. For now that I look at the inscription inside, I find the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. Besides, you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I know that fact, but I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one talks about in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily, and you have already said you don't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. It's your aunt. Yes. Charming lady, too. Li lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algie. Yes, but why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives in Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt, and that is absurd. For heaven's sake, Algie, just give it back to me. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear uncle, Jack. There's no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, but what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. And besides, your name isn't Jack at all, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. <laughs> <laughs> told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name is Ernest. You're the most Ernest looking person I ever saw in my life. <laughs> it is perfectly absurd. You're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing B. for the Albany. I will keep this as proof your name is Ernest. If you ever attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. My name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country. The cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for why your little Aunt Cecily, who lives in Tunbridge Wells, should call her own nephew her uncle. Come on, boy, you must better have it out at once. My dear fellow, you talk exactly as if you are a dentist. It is a very vulgar <laughs> thing to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. <laughs> well, that is exactly what dentists do. Now go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret bunburist, and I am quite sure of it now. Bunburist? What on earth do you mean by bunburist? I will reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to reveal to me why you are Ernest and Chown and Jack in the country. But produce my cigarette case first. <sighs> Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. Dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will a guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as uncle from motives of respect which you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my house in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not to be invited. And I might tell you quite candidly, the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bumbered all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to appreciate my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one must adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or to one's happiness, I pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful of scrapes. That, dear Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Oh, literary criticism is not your fault, my dear fellow. Don't try it. Leave that to people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. <laughs> no, what you really are is a bunburyist. 
I was quite right in saying you were Bunburyist. You're one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth is a Bunburyist? <sighs> you have invented a very useful younger brother by the name of Ernest, so that you may come up to town whenever you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may go down to the country whenever I choose. And Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. For instance, if it weren't for poor Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for I really haven't engaged Aunt Augusta for more than a week. But I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're absurdly careless about sending invitations. It's very foolish of you. You're not annoyed people so much as not receiving invitations. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. Oh, I haven't any intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. And in the second place, every time I do dine there, I'm sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, whenever I do go down there, she always places me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it's not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. <laughs> and besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunbury. And I want to tell you the rules. You're not a Bunburyist at all. If I marry Gwendolyn, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too interested in him. It's rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. Your invalid friend with the absurd name. Oh, nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you'll be very glad to know Bunbury. Any man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. Oh, that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever met that I would want to marry, I certainly wouldn't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is, well, none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, but the happy English home has proved in half the time. Oh, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it doesn't need to be anything nowadays. There's such beastly competition about it. <laughs> ah, now that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that magnarian manner. Now, if I get put out of the way for, say, uh, Ten minutes, so that you may have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn. May I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Ah, uh, yes, but you must be serious about it, my old boy. I hate people who aren't serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Blackburn, Miss Fairfax! <laughs> Good afternoon, dear old mom. I hope you are behaving very well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That is not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Are not I, Mr. Worthy? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave very little room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I would like to call on dear Lady Harbury. I haven't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looked quite... 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Uh, thanks, Mama, but I'm quite comfortable where I am. <laughs> Good heavens! Lane! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? <laughs> there were no cucumbers at the market this morning, sir. <gasps> I, I went down twice. No cucumbers. No, sir. Not even for ready money. <laughs> that will do, Lane. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> I am greatly distressed about 
there being no cucumbers, Aunt Augusta. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I have some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who, it seems to me, is living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has some quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I, of course, cannot say thank you. I've quite the treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm sending you down with Mary Farquhar. She is such a nice woman, and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. My dear Aunt Augusta, I am afraid I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is, I have just received a telegram saying that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Oh, yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, Algernon, I think it's high time that this Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he were going to live or to die. <laughs> 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 this shilly shallying with the question is absurd, nor do I in any way approve of this modern fascination with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice as far as any improvements in his ailments go. But I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday. For I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has said practically everything they had to say, which, in most cases, was probably not much. I will speak to Paul Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious. Mm -hmm. And I think I can promise that he'll be quite all right by Saturday. Now, the music is a great difficulty. For you see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I will go over the program I've drawn out. If you will... Be so kind as to accompany me into the next room for a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program would be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. <laughs> <laughs> German, though, sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed, I believe, is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. <laughs> Charming weather today, Miss Fairfax. Pray do talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I'm always quite certain that they mean something else, and that makes me so nervous. But I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, would be, I'll, I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of suddenly coming back into a room that I have often had to talk to her about. <laughs> Gwendolyn, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any other girl I've ever met since I have met you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm quite aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I knew I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines. <laughs> and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me? Passionately. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but your name is Ernest. 
have always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? <laughs> I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. <laughs> I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, education produces absolutely no effect whatsoever. <laughs> if it did, it would probably prove a serious danger to the upper classes and lead to violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position, then prevents one from keeping it up. That is all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe. Uh, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In, in fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only ones who make anything out of it. <laughs> <coughs> A country house. How many bedrooms? Oh, well, that point can be cleared up after. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I have a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. I can get it back, of course, whenever I like, at six months' notice. <laughs> Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. <laughs> I knew there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. Mm -hmm. What are your politics? I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. Now, on to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> 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 Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers called the Purple of Commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I don't really know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost both my parents, but it would be nearer the truth to say they seem to have lost me. I don't know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? <laughs> yes, found. The late Mr. Thomas Carter, an older gentleman of a very kindly and charitable disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing, because he had a first-class ticket to Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman with a first-class ticket to this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. <laughs> <laughs> a handbag? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a handbag. A somewhat large, upholstered handbag. With handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew, come across this ordinary handbag. The cloak from at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloak room. At the Victoria Station. <laughs> yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. And Mr. Worthing, I confess I am somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me to be born, or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles to it or not, <laughs> seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that remind one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, the cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, as probably, indeed, been used to this purpose before now but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. 
I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce, at any rate, one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag for you at any moment. <laughs> it's in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Rackham. <laughs> me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracken would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom <laughs> and form an alliance with a parcel. <gasps> Good morning, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> Good morning! <laughs> someone else if she's plain. Oh, that is nonsense. Oh, it isn't. Well, what about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, by the end of the week I shall have got rid of him. I shall say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Mm. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it is hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say he died from a uh, severe chill. And you're sure severe chill isn't hereditary or that kind of thing? Oh, of course it isn't. That settles it. Ernest was carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you had said that, uh, uh, Miss Cardian was a little too much interested in your brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Oh, that's all right. Cecily isn't a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She has a capital appetite, goes on long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I shall take extremely great care that you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? That isn't the sort of thing one blurts out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are perfectly certain to become extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that a half hour, a half hour after they have met, they shall be calling each other sister. Women only do that after calling each other lots of other things first. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we really want to get a good table at Willis's, my old boy, we really must go and dress. Do you know it is already nearly seven? Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. <laughs> I never knew you were alert. <laughs> what shall we do after dinner? Go, go to a theatre? Oh, no, I love listening. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we go to the 
<laughs> yeah. Oh no, I hate talking. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we might trot around the Empire, round ten. Oh no, I can't bear looking at things. <laughs> <laughs> well, what shall we do? Nothing. Oh. It's very hard work doing nothing. But I don't mind hard work when there's no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Uh, Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthy. Uh, really, Gwendolyn, I don't believe I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a very strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. <laughs> my own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the look on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents pay any regard to what their children have to say to them nowadays. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. <laughs> but although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and very often, <laughs> nothing that she can possibly do will ever alter my eternal devotion to you. Gwendolyn! The story of your romantic origins, as related to me by Mama with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. <laughs> your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address in the Albany I have. But what is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. That is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. But that, of course, would require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn round now. Thanks. I've turned round already. <laughs> and you may ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, Miss Fairfax. Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. <laughs> of Sherry Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going thundering. Yes, sir. And I probably won't be back till about Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Lane. You are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. Thank you, sir. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth are you so amused <laughs> at? <laughs> oh. oh, nothing, nothing. I'm just anxious about more Bunburys. Oh. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury is going to get you into a serious scrape someday. Oh, I do love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. Oh, that is nonsense. You never talk anything but nonsense. No, nobody ever does. <laughs>
occupation as a watering of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours? Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open at page 15. We'll repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. This is all the coming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. Indeed, he laid particular stress on your German when he was leaving for town yesterday. In fact, he always lays particular stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious, I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is one to be particularly commended for one so comparatively young as he is. Why, I know no one with a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that's why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember that constant anxiety he faces about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down to you sometime. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prince. <coughs> I'm sure you certainly would. You know German and geology and things of that nature influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could have any effect on a man who, by his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I do not think that I would wish to reclaim him. Not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. Cecily, you must put away your diary. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have not happened and could not possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels the movie set in France. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novel, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. <laughs> did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels which end happily. They depress me so much. <laughs> <laughs> the good ended happily, the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose. <laughs> but it seems awfully unfair. And was your novel ever published? <laughs> Alas, no. The manuscript was unfortunately abandoned. Oh. I use the word as in lost or mislaid. To, to your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up to the garden. <laughs> Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I believe it would do her so much good to have a short stroll through the garden with you, Dr. Chasuble. <laughs> I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. In fact, I was thinking about this and not my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. <laughs> Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> 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 I spoke metaphorically, and my metaphor was drawn from beads. Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet. We do not expect him back till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as, by all accounts, that unfortunate young man, his brother, seems to be. However, I will not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. <laughs> A classical allusion, merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at even so. I, I think, dear Doctor, that I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache, after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. Oh, that would be delightful. <laughs> oh, Cecily, you will read your 
political economy in my absence, the chapter on the fall of the rookie you may omit, it is a bit too sensational. Even these melodramatic problems have their melodramatic side. Oh, horrid political economy, horrid geology, and horrid, horrid German. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. <coughs> I mentioned you, Miss Prism, in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come out here. And I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. I have never met any truly wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid you look just like everyone else. He does! <laughs> Why, you are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You like me from your card, uh, my guardian's brother, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, really, Cecily? I'm not really wicked at all. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope that you have not been living a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh, of course I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. And now that you mention it, I have been very bad in my own small way. Well, I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it was very pleasant. Oh, it is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you're here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back until Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up on the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. And couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? Oh no, the appointment is in London. Well, I understand how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wishes to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, <laughs> I think you had better wait until Uncle Jack arrives. I know he's anxious to speak with you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. <laughs> Uncle Jack has gone up to buy your outfit. Oh, I would never let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties where you're going. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, <laughs> at supper on Wednesday night, Uncle Jack said you could choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the accounts I have heard of the next world in Australia are not particularly encouraging, Cousin Cecily. This world is good enough for me. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I am not that. <laughs> that is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind me reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. I have thoughtless <laughs> of me. I should have remembered that when one's going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A marché meal? Uh, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Well, because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right if you say such things to me. Miss Prism never talks to me like that. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. And Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. A snare that every sensible man should like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I should like to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> you are too much alone, dear doctor. You should get married. A misanthrope I can understand. A woman throat, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. Well, that is obviously why the primitive church has not lasted up until the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself to a permanent public temptation. 
<laughs> a single man should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. Uh, but is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. <laughs> and even then, I've been told, not even to her. Well, that depends on the intellectual capacities of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. My brother! Uh, more shameful debts and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead! <laughs> Your brother <laughs> is dead. Quite dead! What a lesson to him. I trust he will profit by it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I offer my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Yes, very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. And was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. <laughs> As a man so, so let him reap. Charity, Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to draughts. <laughs> Will the interment take place here? He seemed to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris! Oh, in Paris! <laughs> I fear that hardly points to a very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt like me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the desert can be adapted to almost any occasion. <laughs> Joyful, or in the present case, distressing. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation, and on festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral, as a charity sermon for the Society for the Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Ah, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chasuble. I suppose you know how to christen all right. I mean, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in the parish. I have often tried to preach it to the poor classes, but I don't think they seem to understand what thrift is. <laughs> <laughs> but is there any child in particular whom you're interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. Uh, but surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. And have you any great doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. <laughs> of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling, and in fact the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, and indeed, I think, advisable. Our weather is so changeable. Hmm. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? I might trot round about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins that occurred on the out one of the out outlying cottages on your estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter, a most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened with other babies. It seems childish. What happens if I do? Admirably, admirably. And now, Mr. Worthing, I must not intrude into a house of sorrow any longer. I would merely beg that you not be too bowed down by grief. What seemed to us bitter times are often blessings in disguise. It seems to me to be the blessing of the most obvious kind. <laughs> Uncle Jack! Oh, I am so pleased to see you back! <laughs> what hard clothes you have on. Do you go and change them. Oh, my child, my child. What seems to be the matter, Uncle Jack? You look as though you have a toothache, and I have the most wonderful surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? <laughs> <laughs> oh, our brother. He arrived about half an hour ago. But, 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 but I haven't got a brother. Uncle Jack, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved towards you in the past, he is still your 
your brother. You wouldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll go get him, and you'll shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother in the dining room? I don't know what it all means. I think you're perfectly absurd. Good heavens! <laughs> Ah, there she is. Oh, I thought you were with Uncle Jack. I nearly came out to water the roses. 
He's gone to fetch the dog cart for me. Is he going to take you for a nice drive? No. He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people who one is only known for very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. <laughs> but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. <laughs> Thank you. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes? Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily, when I say quite frankly and openly that I believe you to be the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you a great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? Oh, I would give anything to read it. May I? No! It is simply a young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. <laughs> I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You may go on. I am quite ready for more. <laughs> pray, Ernest, don't cough. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. <laughs> Cecily, ever since I have looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should say you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily? <laughs> the dog watch is waiting, sir. Tell it to come around next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed that you told the dog cart to come around next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anyone in the whole world but you. I love you, sis. You will marry me, won't you? Silly boy, of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> For the last three months? <laughs> yeah, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first mentioned that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you of course have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Pridham. And of course a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Oh, darling. And when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. When, after your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other, and after a long struggle with myself, I settled the matter. And I accepted you, under this dear old tree here. The next day, I went out and bought this little ring in your name. And this is the bangle with the true lovers knot that I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? <laughs> it is very pretty, isn't it? Yes, Ernest. You have wonderfully good taste. <laughs> the excuse I've always given you for living such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all of your dear letters. My letters? But my dear Cecily, I've never written you any letters. Dear Ernest, you need hardly remind me of that. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote always three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Oh, but do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. They would make me far too conceited. The three you wrote to me after I first broke off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that I can still hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather continues charming. <laughs> <laughs> but why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing at all. Indeed, Cecily. I'm quite hurt to hear that you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. <laughs> well, it would probably be a very serious engagement if I hadn't broken it off at least once. But I forgave you before the week. <laughs> oh, what a perfect angel you are, Cecily. It's your romantic form. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes, darling. With a little help from others. I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. 
You will never break off our engagement again, will you, Cecily? I don't think I could now that I've actually met you. Besides, there is the question of your name. Of course. Now you mustn't laugh at me, darling, but it's always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> there is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But what other name? Oh, any name you like, Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. <laughs> well, my dear, <coughs> sweet, loving little darling, I see no reason at all why you should object to the name of Algernon. Uh, it is. Not at all a bad name. In fact, a rather aristocratic name. How the chaps would get into the bankruptcy court are named Algernon. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, Cecily, if my name were Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you. Uh, <laughs> I might admire your character, but I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. <laughs> Cecily, uh, I assume your rector here is familiar with all the rites and ceremonials of the church? Oh yes, Dr. Chasuble's a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean, on most important business. Oh? Uh, I shan't be away more than half an hour. Well, considering that we have only been engaged for three months, and that I only just met you today for the first time, a half an hour seems an awfully long time to part. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I will be back in no time. <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I hope he's going to put his proposal into my diary. A Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing on very important business Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in the library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Can I ask the lady to come out here? And you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax, no doubt one of the many good elderly women associated with Uncle Jack and some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't like women interested in philanthropic work. I feel it's so forward of them. <laughs> miss Fairfax. <laughs> miss Fairfax, pray let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've only known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this would be a favorable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for a man. But certainly, once a man begins to, to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. <laughs> Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has raised me to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of a system. So, would you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Not at all, Gwendolyn. <laughs> I am quite fond of being looked at. <laughs> you are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no, I live here. Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years, resides here also? No, I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. Miss Prism, with, along with my guardian, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, it is very strange. He never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How very secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. <laughs> you ever since I first met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I 
can't help expressing a wish that you were a little older than you seem to be and not quite so alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly. Pray do. I think that whenever anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. <laughs> not to speak with perfect candor, Cecily. I wish you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. <laughs> Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the physical charms in others. Modern, no less than ancient history, provides us with many of the most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Ernest who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I am sorry to say that they have not been on very good terms for a long time. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject <laughs> seems as <laughs> tasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. And it would have been terrible if a cloud had come across a friendship like ours. Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite sure. In fact, I am engaged to be his. I beg your pardon. <laughs> newspaper short to chronicle the fact next week. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> <laughs> My darling Cecily, I feel there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday at the latest. <laughs> Dearest Gwendolyn, I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly very curious. For he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you wish to verify the incident, pray do so. <laughs> I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. <laughs> I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you. But I'm afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can say, dearest Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. <laughs> if the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall see it as my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever entanglement my dear boy may have gotten himself into, I shall never reproach him with it once we are married. <laughs> Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. <laughs> On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean to say, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. Well, I'm glad to say that I've never seen a spade. <laughs> it is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay tea here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Yes, quite many. On a hill quite close to here, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. <laughs> I suppose that's why you live in town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. I'm so glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I could never understand how anybody managed to exist in the country. If anybody who is anybody does, uh, the country always bores me to death. This is what the papers are calling agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, or so I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl. <laughs> but I require tea. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> 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 Cake or bread and butter? Bread 
and butter, please. <laughs> Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. Ooh. <laughs> and that to Miss Fairfax. <laughs> <laughs> I liked, but my name most certainly is John. It has been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on the both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. <laughs> <laughs> you will call me sister, won't you? <laughs> intention of ever having one in the future. <laughs> no brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? <coughs> no, not even of any kind. <laughs> well, I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to find herself in suddenly, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to mark us in there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? <laughs> this ghastly state of things is what you call bunbury. 
Pudding, I suppose. Yes, what a perfectly wonderful Bunbury it is, too. The most <laughs> wonderful Bunbury I've ever had in my life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. Oh, that is absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. A serious Bunburyist? Good <laughs> heavens. Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. What well, I don't know that you are so serious about, I haven't got the remotest idea. About everything, I should fancy you have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, this only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. We won't be able to run down to the country quite so much as you used to, Algie, and a very good thing, too. Your brother is looking a little, uh, off-color, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear into London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was, and not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I find your taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. Well, I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant and clever and thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. I love her. I merely wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. Well, there's certainly no chance of you marrying Miss Cardew. There's not much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax ever being united. Well, that is none of your business. If it were my business, I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> oh, you see, it is very vulgar if one to talk about one's business. Only people like Starkbroker through that, and I'm really at dinner parties. How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we're in all this horrible trouble is beyond me. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated man, and the butter would probably get on my cups. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It's the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless to eat muffins at all under the circumstances. When I'm in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. <laughs> Indeed, when I'm in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I refuse everything, except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating muffins because I am unhappy. And besides, I am particularly fond of muffins. Well, that is no reason to eat them all in that greedy way. Well, I wish you would have tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens! I suppose a man made his own muffins in his own garden! <laughs> you have just said it was perfectly heartless of eating muffins. I said it's perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances. That is a different thing. Well, that... Maybe, but the muffins are the same. <laughs> Aldi, I wish to goodness you would go. Well, you can't ask me to go without having any dinner. That is absurd. I never go anywhere without my dinner. Nobody ever does, except vegetarians and people like that. <laughs> Besides, I have already spoken to Dr. Chasmal and made arrangements to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I have made arrangements myself to be christened with Dr. Chasmal at 5.30. And I naturally would be taking the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There's no evidence I've ever been christened at all by anybody. And I should think it extremely probable I never was. So does Dr. Chasuble. It is entirely different in your case. You have already been christened. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. <laughs> <laughs> you have already been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you're not quite sure about your ever having been christened, I dare say it rather dangerous of you venturing on it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely related to you was nearly carried off in Paris this week by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself a severe chill was not hereditary. It used to be, I know. But I dare say it is now. Scientists are making wonderful improvements in things. Oh, that is nonsense. Jack, you got the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. I already told you I'm particularly fond of muffins and there are only one left. But I hate tea cake. Well, then why on earth do you allow it to be served up for your guests? I have no idea. What ideas you have of hospitality? Algie, I have already asked you to go. I don't want you here. Why won't you go? Well, I haven't quite had my tea yet. <laughs> and besides, there's still one muffin left. <laughs>
wide silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we shall not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing! <laughs> Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I may have had an opportunity of meeting you. I am more than satisfied with what Mr. Moncrief has said. <laughs> well, dear, I don't know if you can believe him. I don't, but that doesn't change the wonderful beauty of his answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerity is the vital thing. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have the opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, <laughs> but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. <laughs> Their explanations appear quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. Mr. Moncrief's voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. I have <laughs> forgotten. There are principles at stake that one simply cannot surrender. Which of us should be the one to tell them the task is not a pleasant one? Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. <laughs> <laughs> Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you are willing to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd it is to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where matters of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. <laughs> there are moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. <coughs> Lady Bracknell! What happens? <laughs> Gwendolyn, what does this mean? <laughs> Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. <coughs> Come here. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weakness in the old. <laughs> a prize, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. <laughs> I would consider it wrong. But, of course, you will clearly understand that all communications between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment, on this point, as indeed on all points. I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. Algernon! Yes, Aunt Augusta. <laughs> May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh. Ah. Uh, ah. <laughs> uh, no. No, no, no. Ah. Uh, Bunbury doesn't live here. Ah. Uh, Bunbury, you see, is, is somewhere else at present. Uh, Bunbury in. Ah. Uh, Bunbury. Bumbery is dead. <laughs> dead? When did he die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. <laughs> I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. Well, what did he die of? Well, poor Bunbury was quite exploded. Exploded? <laughs> Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? <laughs> I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. <laughs> My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean, poor Bunbury was found out. Uh, the doctors found out that poor Bunbury could no longer live. <laughs> so, <laughs> poor Bunbury died. <laughs> to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physician. <laughs> <laughs> I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at last to stop a definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have got rid of this Mr. 
Mr. Bunbury, may I ask Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? <laughs> that young lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily Antigaster. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Brown. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, <laughs> but the number of engagements that go on seem to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. <laughs> <laughs> I think that some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> I merely desire information. Uh -huh. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. <laughs> Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporin, Fifeshire, NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, <laughs> <laughs> even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have the court guides of the period carefully preserved. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Her solicitors are the Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I also have in my possession, you will be pleased to know, records of her birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, confirmation, vaccination, and the measles, both of the German and English variety. <coughs> <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, uh, about a hundred and thirty thousand pounds in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. I found it, Mr. Worthing. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred and thirty thousand pounds, and in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady mm. now that I look at her. <laughs> <laughs> Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities. Any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple, and your hair looks almost as nature has left it. But we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvelous effect in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to the young lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. Kindly turn round, sweet child. No, no, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, and prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence for social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs>
Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak quite frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting, Lady Bracknell, but I must say that this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what ground, sir? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, ostentatiously eligible young man. <laughs> <laughs> he has nothing, but he looks everything. <laughs> desire. Pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is, I do not approve of his moral character at all. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon, impossible! He is an Oxonian! I'm afraid there can be no possible doubt about the matter. Yesterday afternoon, during my temporary absence to London on a question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut, 89, a wine I was specially reserving for myself. <laughs> Continuing his disgraceful deceit, he succeeded in the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. Subsequently, he stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. <laughs> what makes his conduct all the more heartless is he was very well aware from the first that I have no brother, never had a brother, and have no intention of ever having a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. <coughs> Mr. Worthing? After careful consideration, I decided to entirely overlook my nephew's conduct to you. <laughs> How very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My decision, however, remains unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come over here, dear. How old are you? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 at evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. <laughs> 18. But admitting to 20 at evening parties. But I don't think it will be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting again, Lady Bracknell, but it is only fair to tell you that, according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come of age until she is 35. <laughs> <laughs> that does not seem to me to be a great objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. <laughs> Cecily, you know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. <laughs> I hate waiting for anyone, even for five minutes. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to display a somewhat impatient nature, I would <laughs> beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, <laughs> the decision is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what she proposes is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us have to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come along, dear. We've already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. <laughs> <laughs> the christenings, sir. Is that not somewhat premature? <laughs> <laughs> Both of these 
gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The thought is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracken would be highly displeased if he learned that this was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as the way things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. Mr. Worthing, I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you. They savor of the heretical views of the Anabaptists. Views! which I completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. <laughs> <laughs> However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. In fact, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Uh, Miss Prism? <laughs> Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I am on my way to join her. Uh, pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of grave importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, <laughs> remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. <laughs> <laughs> may I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her immediately. Let her be sent for. Oh, she approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting there for you for an hour and three quarters! <laughs> <laughs> Is 
Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends upon your answer. It appears to be mine. Oh, yes, here is the injury I've received by the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in earlier and happier days. Oh, and here on the lining is the stain caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident which occurred at Leamington. Oh, and here are my, not, are my initials. I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had them placed there. <laughs> <laughs> the bag is undoubtedly mine. I'm delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It's been quite an inconvenience being without it all these years. <laughs> More is restored to you than the handbag, Miss Prism. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes, mother! Mr. Uh, Worthing, I'm unmarried! Unmarried? I cannot deny it is a serious blow. What right does one have to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you! Mr. Worthing, there is some error! There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. <gasps> <laughs> lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive. Uh, would you kindly inform me of who I am? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief. And consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Not <laughs> <laughs> his elder brother. I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have doubted that I had a brother? Oh, Dr. Jasper, my unfortunate brother. Yes, Miss Prison, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. We've met. <laughs> You've got to start treating me with more respect in the future. You've never behaved like a brother to me in all your life. Well, not today, old boy. Although I did my best, however, I was out of practice. <laughs> my own? But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you've become someone else? Good heavens. I had quite forgotten about that point. Your decision on my name remains irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affections. What a <laughs> noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. <laughs> well, then the matter had best be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism deposited me in that handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished upon you by your fond and doting parents. Then I have been christened. That settles it. What was my Christian name? Let me know the worst. Well, being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at present recall what the general's Christian name was, but I have no doubt that he had one. He was an eccentric, but only in later years, and that was the result of the Indian climate. <laughs> and marriage. <laughs> and indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> and other things of that kind. Algy, surely you can recall our father's Christian name? Oh, I'm afraid not, old boy. We weren't even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. <laughs> I suppose it would appear in the army lists of the period. The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. <laughs> but I have no doubt that his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here! Oh, these delightful records should have been my constant study. And generals. Malum, Moxbum, Magley. What ghastly names they have. <laughs> Markby, Migsby, Mobs, Moncrief, Captain, 1840. Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869. Christian names. Ernest John. <laughs> I'm sure I'm to say it like <laughs> <laughs> I told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest. Well, it is Ernest after all. I, I mean, naturally, it is Ernest. Yes, I remember the General was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. <laughs> My own Ernest. I felt from the first you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia! Frederick! At last! <laughs> <Cecilia>. <laughs> 
my nephew. You seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs> <laughs> Go lace the charm for the fair, and I pity your death and despair. While I love this professions when acting in Hessians are eloquent everywhere. A fact which I counted upon when I first put this uniform on. By a simple coincidence, you could never have come in a I didn't anticipate that when I first put this uniform on. 